This video is brought to you by The Container Store. Yo, 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 welcome to Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. It's the show that has to admit that the Knicks are back. Double get over time! Don't you regret not coming to the Knicks! Let's go, Knicks! Bing bong! Look, I'm sure we could have made a similar video here in LA if the Lakers were bad for as long as the Knicks were this century, but it wouldn't be the same. I tip my hat to you Knicks fans. Oh, and I can already feel the countdown to the discourse turning on that video starting in like five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's start with some hot takes. You might be watching this as Astroworld is going on in Houston and there appears to be two sneaker themed events that you will need a Nike sneakers pass to get into. Uh oh, what about all those people who said they deleted their app because they couldn't handle taking L's anymore? Will they re-download again to take an L in real life? Was it all just performative clout chasing on social media? We may never know. Shout out to Jay-Z for playing it cool when good friend and Brooklyn Nets co-owner Clara Wusai accidentally caused Hove to almost spill his drink during the Nets heat game a few days ago. Man, must be nice to be so rich and cool with Jay that he's perfectly fine with you making him spill drinks on his Pumas. I would be so frozen in fear if I did that. But then again, I'll never know because I would have taken the $500,000 instead of having dinner and a Nets game with Hove badgering him for financial advice. If I did that, he would have thrown that drink at me by halftime for being so annoying for asking so many dumb questions. Speaking of that game, PJ Tucker asserted his sneaker dominance yet again when he brought out the Carhat Eminem Air Jordan 4 collab for warmups. The rare pair is valued between $20,000 and $30,000. Okay, now here's the question for sneakerheads. Would you rather have dinner and a Nets game with Jay-Z when you spill his drink, which would then lead to you probably getting your ass kicked by his security and Nets security, or... Would you rather have PJ's worn car hat Slim Shady 4s? During an interview with Hot 97, RZA of Wu-Tang Clan admits that he regrets selling the one-of-a-kind album Once Upon a Time in Shaolin to the infamous pharma bro Martin Shkreli. RZA says that he made the deal with Shkreli before the scumbag would reveal his actual character and all the shady stuff that he would eventually do, which includes hiking the price up of a life-saving HIV drug from $13.50 a pill to $750 a pill, being a jackass on live stream, offering bounties for a strand of hair from a former presidential candidate, being guilty on two counts of security Securities fraud and one count of conspiracy to commit securities fraud and being a jerk to Ghostface Killer. No disrespect to RZA, which is one of the goats, but Shkreli looks like a kid that if he was born 10 years later would be using his mom's credit card to buy up all the white van slip-ons in stock so nobody could get a proper Squid Game Halloween fit off unless they paid 10 times the retail price. Either that or go to New York and record people in New York doing New York things, but editing them so they look like caricatures and not real people. Bing bong. Wendy Powick is an amateur golfer in Australia who helped answer the question that's been burning in my head ever since I took up the sport a few years ago. Do kangaroos just randomly show up in a pack when you play golf down under? The answer is yes, apparently. Well, at least I can always use the excuse that the kangaroo threw my ball in the water or hit it in their pouch if I hit a bad shot. The PlayStation 5 is now the best selling console of this generation in terms of money being brought in, overtaking the Nintendo Switch, which has been dominating the field since it first launched back in 2017. The Switch still holds the lead in total units sold, and that won't change anytime soon because of the three year head start Nintendo has, and how they're still getting people to rebuy the Switch multiple times thanks to the light and the OLED models. Oh, and there's the whole PlayStation 5s are like John Cena because you can't see them anywhere thing. The moral of this story, not even the PG5 could bring Sony down. Damn, that was petty, co-writer. Yo, when it comes to storing your kicks, there's really only one place that's the gold standard, and that's the container store. The drop front boxes are easily the nicest way to store your kicks, and they come in three different sizes and four different colors. They even come with the big XL size that you can put a shoebox in. Now, if you can't decide which one or which color to get, you can get yourself a gift card. And if you do want to get some right now, I actually have a code for 25% off a case of six. It's available online only at thecontainerstore.com, and the code is drop front. Available online only at thecontainerstore.com. So, the news is out that Virgil Abloh will be making off-white Nike Air Force One mids. The mid agenda continues, and I hope you're happy, Nice Kicks. The leak, which has since been confirmed by Virgil, shows an entirely new take on the Air Force One mid, going with a synthetic upper and an ankle strap that ditches the design of the original, at least from this angle, and out for a grid-like pattern. 
There's the colorful and wrapped tooling with a shape that looks like a little out of control with differing patterns and edges, a translucent swoosh, the off-white branding that we're all familiar with by now, and the lacing pattern that seems to be borrowed from the off-white dunks with their odd placement. Reaction is mixed, as is the case with most off-white Nike collabs. If the final product ends up looking anything like this leak, I wouldn't be surprised if these sold like crazy. At the same time though, I wouldn't be surprised if these crashed and burned and sat on shelves like Vapor Streets from a few years back. I think purists are hating these because of how much Virgil deviates from the Air Force One iconic look. Yes, even the mid and the casual fans are trying to gauge the hype to see if this is something that everyone will jump on. On a personal level, I'm not really feeling these in the same way I don't get too excited for Air Force Ones in general. What I'm more interested in is the discourse of mids. The push by the sneaker media Illuminati to make people like mids as a concept lately has been directed towards the Air Jordan 1 mid. Meanwhile, the Air Force 1 mid has been taking it on the chin for years now. It was first introduced in 1994 as the Air Force One silhouette was taking off in popularity and expanding past the shoe's reputation as a product that was only sold in the inner city. I'm not gonna say that this was the gentrified version of the Air Force One, but I'm also not not saying it. While it doesn't catch jokes like Jordan One mids, Air Force One mids are often forgotten, which might actually be a worse fate than being clowned on. There have been a number of notable Air Force One mids collabs throughout the years, from Supreme to Ricardo Ticci, and those have built interest and hype for the middle of the pack model. But that hasn't translated into more people rocking with the general releases or special edition mids. But now that Nike's hitmaker is here, will that turn the tides and the mids narrative become the mid supremacy? See, Virgil is really testing the strength of the Off-White brand and how much sway they have with the upcoming release of the Off-White Air Jordan 2 and this yet to be finalized version of the Air Force One Mid. And that's something that doesn't always get talked about. Like, yes, of course Travis Scott's Cactus Jack collabs with Nike have been on fire, but think about the silhouettes he's had to play with. Air Jordan 1, Air Jordan 4, Air Jordan 6, Nike Air Max 270, Nike SB Dunk, all sold out as soon as they dropped. But what about the Cactus Jack and Air Jordan 33? Yeah, not so much, huh? Sure, it's sold out and commands a slight premium at resale, but it never gets brought up when people talk about Travis's work with Nike. Virgil has cast a wider net when it comes to his collabs, starting with the 10 that includes the Zoom Fly and the Hyperdunk, and those two in particular were quite popular when they first came out. Sometimes a lackluster sneaker design can't be overcome by even a designer or a celebrity or an influencer with the magic touch. In this case, Virgil is not only taking on an oft-ignored model in the Nike Air Force One mid, he's going up against years, well, really decades of apathy. As Monique says, I would like to see it. Will this be the next chapter in the global conspiracy to make us like mids? Will Virgil do the impossible next and work on an off-white Air Jordan 1 mid after conquering the Air Jordan 2 in the Air Force One mid? Who can Nike sucker, I mean, work with on an Air Jordan 21 or Air Jordan 22 collab? And I'll be over here just watching it all play out, taking notes and talking about it on a future episode of Hard Pass. But those are my thoughts. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. It's time for the heat check where we bring you everything that's dropping this week. Let's start off with some sneakers that got their release dates moved back. First, we have the Nike Air Trainer 3 Saquon Barkley on November 5th for $140. The Nike Dunk Low Georgetown on November 5th for $100. Then we have the Women's Nike Dunk High Next Nature Summit White on November 3rd for $130. On the outside, it looks like your next hyped Nike Dunk, but there's a little bit more to it. The shoe is part of a wider line of toasty sneakers that tries to replicate the look and feel of an outdoor trip where everybody is sitting by the campfire trying to make some s'mores. But beyond that, the shoe is also made of 20% recycled material, which is where the next part of the shoe's name comes into play. Women's Nike Dunk Low Next Nature, the number third for $105. Dropping in three colorways, the $5 is for sustainability, I guess. Like... The Toasty Dunk Highs, these dunks will be made of new and recycled materials as Nike pushes their move to zero cause. Unlike previous attempts where Nike has used recycled parts and made sure you know it, these next nature dunks look like any other dunk that has come out in the past several years. The only outward sign that these are a little different comes from the Volt insoles and the Nike grind speckle on the outsole, and even that has become more subtle. We have the Pata Nike Air Max 1 Noise Aqua on the 4th for 160. It's just the wavy pattern that's the big change, no? Man, that's the brilliance of Pata. They're like the geniuses who just look at a picture frame and barely adjust the alignment and everybody freaks out because it looks so good and different. And that's not meant to be a diss, but rather like the biggest compliment. 
Air Jordan 4 GS Wild Things on the 5th. Available exclusively in kids, preschool, and toddler sizes. The Wild Thing 4 is based on the famous children's book, Where the Wild Things Are. But it doesn't seem like there's an official collab since there's no branding on the shoes. It comes in a suede upper with faux fur on the heel and tongue in the same earthy tones and has multicolor wings for the lacing. Adidas Trey Young 1 sells so death ATL on the 5th for 130 as the legend of Trey continues to grow across the world, his home base in the ATL has welcomed him with open arms and their most popular player since Dominique Wilkins. No offense to my man, Iso Joe Johnson. His signature shoe continues to tie him to the community with this collab with Jermaine Dupri's So So Def Records that is a little more colorful than the black and white pair that was first teased a few weeks ago. It's based on the billboard that was by the Atlanta airport and it might just be as iconic as the old school PDX carpet if the tweets I've seen are to be believed. We have our pick of the week. It's the Comme des Garcons Nike Air Foam Posit 1 on the 5th for $520. Dropping in both all black and all white colorways, the CDG foams are finally dropping after they were first previewed back in January as part of the label's fall and winter offerings. The new Foam Posit shell has a Zen Garden-like quality to it, which would make sense considering the origins of CDG. Just for the boldness of pitching a whole new shape for the foam upper, this gets pick of the week by a wide margin, and I would love to get my hands on a pair of these to unbox for the channel. While I'm not what you would consider a foam posit fan, I respect its place in the sneaker culture and what it has done for the legacy of Penny Hardaway. And if this opens the doors for more brands to get a chance to do more with the foam posit with their own custom shells, I love it. But now for a heat check on the price of the CDG foams. I didn't bring it up in the pick of the week bit because, like I said, I admire the audacity to change something that hasn't been changed in nearly 25 years. But to charge $520 for it is going to be a hard pass for me, dog. Is Nike and CDG justified in pricing it that way? Well, kind of if you think about it. Because if you know the story of the phone posits, the OGs were also priced out of this world. But that's because so much research and development went into their making. A quick history lesson here, courtesy of Complex Sneakers and the iconic Soul Provider book by Scoop Jackson. When the foam posit was first developed, it wasn't as easy as your typical leather-based sneaker at the time. Nike took three years and sought pitches from different companies to find the right process. The original mold for the foam posit cost $750,000, which led to the original being priced at $180. Nowadays, people would love it if the foams only cost that much. And when they were done, Nike actually destroyed the molds for some mind-boggling reason, thinking they would never actually remake the foams again for future use. Huh. Even as late as 96 and 97, retros were not on Nike's radar. Fast forward to today, and foams are just a regular occurrence. The materials to make them are still very expensive, no doubt, but at least the molds and the tech are on lock and there's no way Nike is going to destroy them again. But what if someone came along and asked to make a new molds? The $520 on the CDG foams is due to several factors. The use of the foam posit silhouette, the design, research, and development that went into creating a whole new mold that seems even more intricate than the original, and the fact that CDG can charge what, whatever they want, if I'm going to be honest. Am I telling everybody here to boycott the shoes? No. It's still the most noteworthy sneaker of the week, and it could prove to be very influential down the line. People have been playing $700 for dunks at resale. I know this because co-writer braved the elements and the hype beast to find a street hawker dunk in a size 11 and a half on Melrose and Fairfax a few weeks ago. If the phones became in style again, this CDG collab can open the doors for other labels to try their hands at developing new molds. Imagine what a fragment design foam posit could look like. What if Travis Scott surprise dropped his own takes on the foams during Astroworld? And may the sneaker gods help us if Supreme decided to make their molds for the foams. It would probably be like their Air Max Uptempo collabs and the mold would just spell out their name. Regardless of all that, it could be very expensive. And that's not for me, man. Foams are pricey, whether it's $520 or $250, and that's always been a barrier of entry for me. Maybe that's another reason why I never got into foams even as a kid or when they blew up again in the mid to late 2000s thanks to Wale and the DMV. But agree or disagree? Let me know if the CDG foams are worth it to you. It's time for this week's Hard Pass, where we take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go. Like, not knowing what we really, really want. For the past few months, an IG account called Shanghai Soul has been garnering plenty of attention for their posts. It's not your typical sneaker IG account that has the week's hyped retro that comes with an inspirational quote that's somehow attributed to either Will Smith or Tom Hanks or Michael Jordan when you know none of them said that shit. 
It's basically a tour of sneaker stores throughout China that is filled to the brim with Jordan retros. You need Lightning 4s? They got them. Billy Eilish KOs? Got them. Razor Blue 3s? Got them. Off-White 2s? Kidding. They don't have that and they will never be sitting just waiting to be bought. We haven't reached the tipping point yet. Anyways. Shanghai Soul's posts have sparked a lot of discussion online. You've got hot takes from people who really shouldn't be breaking out with any sort of hot take, and you've got veterans of the game sharing their thoughts and knowledge about what's going on. Now, if you ask me, someone who has a segment on this show called Hot Takes and is ostensibly less of a veteran and more of an astute watcher, what I think about seeing a store full of Jordan Retros available for retail price, my first thought is, great. But also, it's not the first time we've been here. Like, it's not uncommon for overseas stores to stock retros that do not sell out but are hyped up for months on end here in the States. In fact, it's actually been happening here in America if you would stop looking at your phone for a second. Okay, keep looking at your phone if you're watching this video on your phone, but as soon as you're done, leave a like, a follow, and a subscribe, and then safely head over to your local store. Anyways, go inside a Foot Locker or a Champs or a Finish Line, especially one that is far from the big markets like Los Angeles or New York, You'll find pollens in your size. You might see Lena Lily May 14 sitting on the shelf. Moonlight 5s, they probably got them. And if they don't have them, you can head on over to that new reseller shop that they just opened up in the same mall and get them for 20 bucks over retail, which looks silly when you see it once, but then your head hurts when you see it for the second or third time in the same mall. So what's going on really? Should we start booking our flights now to make sneaker runs? Well, there's a number of reasons for this occurrence, but mainly it's time. Like it's just time, man. Flipping retros and to a certain degree, all sneakers in general is mainstream. And like anything that goes mainstream, we got people coming in who make it less of a quirk of the game and more of a business. It's like millennials who are on Facebook. Well, excuse me, it's like millennials who were on Meta, the new name of Facebook. Like there was a time when Meta was cool it was a place that you and your college friends used to keep in touch and write on each other's wall and share stuff that you liked without worrying that your data was being sold to a billion dollar corporation, which might be the least nefarious thing Meta has done in the past couple of decades, if you believe all the reports. Eventually, everybody was on Meta, and that meant the kids really shouldn't be on Meta and the olds who really, really shouldn't be on the internet, period. Meanwhile, Meta fell into the trope of trying to be everything to everyone and just failing miserably to please anybody. That's the sneaker game right now. The kids who are too young to be worrying about their brands and their papers started programming bots to buy up all the shoes and the olds who are looking for relevancy and papers started programming their own bots to also buy up all the shoes. Once upon a time, you bought one to rock and one to stock. Nowadays, you'll be lucky to even get just one. Well, that is until now apparently. Now you can do both again and now everybody's unhappy again. It's been brewing for a few years now, but 2021 seems like the time when all of the doom and gloom talk about Jordan retros might finally come to pass. But here's the thing with that. It's a good thing. I, for one, welcome the new things to get hyped for. But again, this ain't the first time we've been through this. There was a time in 2015 or 16 when we thought that Adidas was going to give Nike and Jordan brand a real run for their money with the NMDs and the Ultra Boots. It had the Yako sign, and for a few months there, every influencer was rocking three stripes. Unfortunately, Adidas was not able to capitalize on the momentum. They were able to transfer a lot of that energy to the Yeezy brand, and that is what has sustained and endured these past several years, but NMDs and Ultra Boost are in the same space as Superstars and Stan Smith's. Iconic silhouettes to be sure, but nobody's getting excited about them. Under Armour had the smallest of run with Steph Curry's signature shoe debut, but then the Chef Curry 2s became a cultural touchstone for all of the wrong reasons, and they've been trying to dig out of that hole since. Puma has been playing the long game for a while now with a partnership with Rihanna, J. Cole, Jay-Z, and now LaMelo Ball, but I don't know if they are ready for the takeover. The same goes for New Balance 550s and Salehi Bimbari's collabs with the brand. They have mind share right now, but we'll see if that translates to anything long term. And oh, how I wish all of these things became a long-term thing. Look, sneakers are not going anywhere. Those Jordan Metro sitting on a shelf is not a sign that the sneaker bubble is bursting, but rather it's just evolving. OG sneakerheads are always going to be sneakerheads. And if they don't like these new retro colorways that are dropping on a weekly basis, they'll turn to a different brand to get their kicks and fits off. And you know they'll be back anyways when an OG colorway or a very desirable collab releases that sets the bar once again, kind of like the first off-white Air Jordan 1 that was part of the 10. Resellers are going to reshape and rebuild and find the next thing so they can hustle some poor kids out of 100 bucks or so. And if they diversify their reselling portfolio, maybe that means we can breathe just a little bit. If this all feels a little disjointed, 
is because I'm trying to figure out what it is that most of the people seeing this all play out actually care about. Like, let's use the pollens as an example. We get hyped up for a new Jordan 1 that has a slight Wu-Tang Dunk vibe. You've got fans who are itching to grab a pair and doom and gloomers who would just say stuff like, ah, can't wait to catch an L or I hope the resellers choke on those receipts. It goes on for weeks. And then when the shoes drop, they sell out on sneakers. The app trends, it's people complaining and threatening to delete the app. You might think, well, the shoes are available at malls here in America, not just in China. That should make people happy, right? Wrong. There is a Venn diagram of people who are both upset they can't get the pollens on the app, but can't buy them in stores. Can't buy pollens on the app? Shoe game dead. Pollens are available in stores, so they must be bricks? Yeah, shoe game dead. Huh? What we really want is for the pollens to be as easy to buy as a tap on the sneakers app. Getting up from bed, taking a shower, brushing our teeth, and putting on an outfit is too much work. We want the adrenaline rush of the got em message. What we really, really want is that wall of Jordan retros on the sneakers app. It's this weird game we play in our heads. It's all a mess, and until we figure out the balance, this cycle is going to continue for a while. But those are just my thoughts. I'd love to hear what you guys think is happening. Is the sneaker game dead, or are things really just evolving? All right, that's going to do it for the show. Thank you guys for watching Hard Pass. I am Jacques Slade. I'll see you next week, but not before I show you the only time a vulture has ever been presented in a positive light. Not gonna lie, I was just waiting for it to fly, but I think it just wanted to flex and show off their fit while everybody was taking pics. I'll see you soon. Peace.